we are jumping back into the book of Judges. So uh, we are in the midst of dealing with the judge Gideon, and um, we have seen him. Uh, we have seen him confronted by the angel of the Lord, called into the ministry of a judge. Uh, we have seen him uh, in that that call be asked to do something that was a, a bit dangerous and scary, and he did it. Um, and uh, now we're starting to move into uh, the uh, the nature of the, the big battle that that is Gideon's claim to fame. So that's where we are at now. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. That's the spot on the slide. Um, now, um, in dealing with um, in dealing with what he was uh, working with here, we're still in chapter six. Um, Verse number 33 is where I'll start reading tonight. Um, now all the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan, encamped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon the Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the uh, Abbey Israelites uh, to, um, to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, uh, so that they too went up to meet them. Gideon said to God, uh, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece, and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out uh, the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. Um, all right. Um, we're talking about Gideon. Now, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the allies in the east, uh, you probably have a pretty good understanding of who those were. The Midianites, uh, basically their, their primary area they lived was on the, the western coast of Saudi Arabia, right along the Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, um, you know, the little tongue of the Red Sea that reaches up toward Israel. Um, the, uh, the Amalekites, um, they lived in a number of spots. Um, some of it is, is, would be considered the Negev, um, close to where the, the Gulf of Aqaba comes up, uh, in between there and the, and the Dead Sea. Actually on the, on the Israeli side of that. Um, but they also had, you know, populations and, and you know, because everyone was a little migratory uh, of these people that pushed over into what would be Saudi Arabia today in Jordan. So um, they were like, if we say the Midianites were here, the Amalekites were here, right? That's generally where they lived. The Eastern people then would be the people that would be in Saudi Arabia and Jordan and maybe even lower Syria. Th those are where all these people came from, all right? So all of these people allied and, and went into Israel proper and we're causing all the problem that we talked about earlier, about how you know they were ruining all the crops, eating everything, driving their uh, cattle over, their uh, camels over everything, taking everything that they wanted to take. And uh, it was just bringing in incredible hardship. So uh, they're coming into Israel now with a force. This is another one of their yearly campaigns, I suppose, that they're, you know, they're trying to pull off. But this time, God has chosen Gideon and has called him to stand up and make a fight. And he tells Gideon that he'll give this big host into his hands. Now Gideon, we talked a little bit before about, uh, a little bit before about uh, the fact that he was a little wimpy when it came to faith. Maybe we can say a lot wimpy. You know, we saw the, the, the deal with the angel of the Lord and how, you know, how he had to basically be convinced you know, to, to do something with that. Now, it's time to go to battle. Uh, he's blown the trumpet. I mean, he's, he's, he's acted on, on the call of God in his life. But right at the moment of truth, right, he gets a little, 
he gets a little scared, right? He, uh, he's a little reluctant. Um, and so he asks for a sign, a sign that will seal the deal. And, and the whole thing with the fleece, you know, it's it weird. It's the dry would be, the ground all around the fleece would be dry. The fleece would be wet. That would be a sign that, that God was really going to deliver in that day. Now, I think about, I look at that and I think, what kind of sign is that? <laughs> it just seems so, seems like so silly and so, so really possible to happen, you know, anyhow, uh, in some way or another. Uh, but it happens just exactly as he asked for. And he wasn't satisfied with that. So he asked again, only he reverses the sign. And this time, that's exactly what happened. Um, the sign was reversed. Uh, the combination of them, I think, really did in Gideon's mind seal the deal. Now he knew that he knew that he knew that he knew that he knew. And so he was ready to go. So he went from being wimpy in faith and, and being, you know, maybe we could say a bit of a chicken. Um, I mean, even when God told him, I want you by the strength that you have to go and deliver Israel. And his response was, you know, what are you talking about? I'm the weakest one in my clan. My clan's the, you know, the weakest one in, 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 in our tribe. You know, no, I, th this isn't going to work. Um, when we get to the, the end of this story, at least, at least this portion of it, um, we'll see that, that Gideon, in talking to one of the kings that he was fighting with, um, asked them about what did the people look like that you were killing at a certain place. And he said, well, they looked a lot like you. And he said, that's right, they were my brothers. You killed my brothers. And so he ends up putting the, the king to death. But the, the description that, the, um, that the, the enemy king gives them is they all look like they're royals. They, you know, they all look like they're kings. In other words, it seems like Gideon must have actually been you know, somewhat formidable in his look. Um, you would think that a big, strong guy like that, maybe he's a you know, guy like Ryan over there. Um, it's like, you know, you, you wouldn't expect somebody like that to, to be such a wimp. You know, so, so frightened and scared, but he was. And it was just the interaction with God that, that turned that around. So um, those are the, Midi uh, the Midianites, or the Midianites and the Amalekites. Uh, now the Valley of Jezreel, I mean, half the battles that we look at, half the stuff going on in the Book of Judges is in this general vicinity. And not only that, but so many battles, not only in the Bible, but in, in ancient history, happened in the Valley of Jezreel. It's, it's just this little bit of a valley that kind of goes through the, the, the middle highlands of Israel. And it's more or less, more or less, it's an east-west valley that gives you a way to get across all the hills and, and whatnot in, with some ease. And it's a broad enough valley. Napoleon said that he could have the battle uh, he had, could have the battle of a lifetime in the Valley of Jezreel because it was just this this little bit of flatness and openness in the midst of all of this this hilliness. And so this is where the battle uh, basically draws up, and Gideon and his uh, army are on one side, and and uh, the Amalekites and Midianites and all the allies from the east are on the other. And it, you know, it, it, when you see that situation, you're just waiting for the time clock to go off. And, set things uh, you know, together. So that's what was going on. Um, they, uh, uh, the confirmation sign, uh, we already talked about all of that, which takes us to uh, this. Now, Gideon's army, when he put out the summons, uh, actually 32,000 uh, soldiers, basically, men, men uh, capable of bearing arms, um, responded to the summons. Um, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good response, given Gideon's description of himself beforehand. You wouldn't think that, you know, who would listen to him. But to blow a trumpet through several tribes, the area, and get thirty-two thousand men showing up like tomorrow, um, that's pretty good. I just that just goes to show how God's hand was on Gideon. You know, he was causing uh, his influence to be. Uh, accepted and responded to. 32,000 men. But this was too many. It wasn't too many to Gideon. 
Giddy, I think, in his thoughts, 32,000 would have seemed like, yeah, that might be enough. Um, there was a lot more Amalekites and Midianites and the allies from the east. There was a lot more than that. I mean, they had, had well over 100,000 people. So, uh, you know, it was an unequal battle even with 32,000. But God did not want this battle to happen with an army that large. Um, ultimately, uh, it's, about, uh, it's about pride more than anything else. Um, we see this as a, a theme uh, in several places. And I have several listed up there on that slide. Uh, if you look at those, those particular citations, we're not going to look at them. I'll just point to them and you can look, on, look at them on your own time. But um, Deuteronomy 8.17, um, we have that, 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 uh, this concept of God wanting to react wanting to bless Israel, but not in a way where they think that their own hand has accomplished it. So in Deuteronomy 8, 17, it's about the, the blessing, the riches, the wealth that they're able to get from, from going into the promised land. And there, you know, the concern that God expresses there is, you're going to, you're, you, you might think that you did this, you accomplished this on your own. And the problem with that is not that God's going to lose his glory. Only a Calvinist would worry about something like that, right? It's not about, it, you know, God isn't worried about that kind of thing. What, what the problem is, is that when we get prideful, we forget about God. Now, that's the problem, right? Uh, it's not that, that God's hurt or that somehow or another that, that he's feeling slighted or that he is so petty that he you know, wants to go and stop because somebody isn't giving him the credit that he deserves. That's, that's not the issue. The issue is that we have a sin problem, and the sin problem at its root is a pride problem. The pride problem is I can do it on my own, I don't need God. The pride problem is uh, if you want something done, you've got to do it yourself. You know, the pride problem is, is so innate in us as human beings. And if that it is not checked, the, the very thing, like God, you know, if God would come into a situation to bring blessing to a people, if the pride thing isn't checked, that, that situation will not result in an ongoing blessing or an ongoing depth of relationship. Instead, it will result in the people getting filled with themselves, puffed up, and turning their eyes away from God. And then at the end result, what you have is lost people. See, then you have folks that are that are apart from God and that aren't that aren't minded to come back. So God doesn't like pride, and this is not you know the spot that we have in this story that we're talking about tonight is not the only place where this theme, this concept, is brought out uh, because it's an important one. We also see it in uh, Psalm 44, uh, verse three, and also uh, Amos chapter six and verse thirteen. The same kind of concerns are expressed there, where where it is, it is uh, well, especially in the Amos uh, passage, it's treated it as if it's an evil for people to forget about God and in pride take credit for themselves, for, for the blessing that's in their lives. Um, and, and Psalm uh, 44, uh, the verse number three, mentions, is mentioning it uh, in, in just the sense of, of you know, the pride that would have uh, affected the nation if they forget God who brought them out of slavery and brought them into the, the land of liberty. So um, there's other places in the Bible. You know, we actually could have a few more verses that deal with this very subject. And that's why I'm saying that this story, bringing this up again in the way that it does, is not, uh, is not meant to, to you know, uh, paint God as, as somebody who is so petty he just has got to do things in a way that just, you know, aggrandizes himself. Um, you know, the picture that we, the truest picture we have of God is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? If you want to know what God's like, you don't have any further to look than the second person in the Trinity, right? You don't have any further to look than at Jesus. And what does the Bible say? That he humbled himself, right? You know, this is, this is the picture of God. He, he's not, he, you know, he's not, he doesn't have his eyes in the mirror you know, trying to puff himself up 
there was a there used to be a show on well it's still on but there's a lot a lot different cast and, and it just got so wild and crazy I gave up on it years and years ago but there used to be a there used to be a, a little skit on the show called daily affirmations and the guy would stand in front of the mirror and he was a bit of a you know a bit of a nerdy kind of clumsy kind of guy and he would say you know you're great you're beautiful <laughs> you're wonderful <laughs> all these the, and they would call it daily affirmations, you know, with this, with this character. So um, that's not God, you know. He, he doesn't. He doesn't have to pump his own ego. The problem comes when our egos get pumped, because when our egos get pumped, then we turn our eyes from God, and we cease to be interested in relating to Him. And you know what? There's no future. In you know, the, the thing about it is, there's no future without God. You, you, you know, we just have to understand this, right? If there is a God, <clears throat> omniscient, omnipresent, almighty, right? There is, there is no place to go that isn't Him. If you don't like Him, there's no place to go. If you don't want to be His friend, there's, there's no place to go. He, he is the thing. All of, everything else that's going on is, is temporary. It's coming to an end. It's going to be brought to an end at some point in time. And then a reckoning is going to be made. And, and so it's just really important for us to understand how this dynamic works and what it's trying to get to. What it's trying to get to is not, you know, that God needs to pump, uh, puff himself up. What it's trying to get to is how deadly and how harmful pride is to us. When it comes to our pride in our achievements, pride in ourselves, pride in what we can accomplish, when we don't, when we don't realize that we are God's people, we are God's sheep, we are not our own, we've been bought with a price, you know, all the various things that the Bible tells us that try to bring this concept to us, right? We are God's. And the healthiest thing that we can do, not only for a moment, but for eternity, is to realize that acknowledging that is life, right? embracing that is life. And it's more than life, right? Because it's life, at the kind of life that God wants us to have. That means it's peace, it's joy, it's love. Right? It, it's all the things that, that, that matter. And so, I mean, it's, it, it's really short-sighted as, as well as being wrong-headed um, to, to embrace the avenue of pride. And so that's, that's you know, what this is all, all about more than anything else. God doesn't want to rescue Israel with 32,000 people because the problem there is that these people who have been so rebellious are going to be quick to take the credit for themselves and in their own mind say, who needs Yahweh? Right? And that's what he's trying to avoid. And if you have that mindset, right, who needs Yahweh? You're going to find out everyone who wants to live after death. That's exactly who they need. Right? We need Yahweh. So, anyhow, uh, 32,000 respond. He whittles it down to 10,000 just by telling the, the people who are fearful and trembling they can go home. I can't imagine a military general saying that. I mean, who, you know, when an army is about to go to war, everybody's shaking in their boots. How many people aren't shaking in their boots in that situation? It's like, you know, the, the thing that, you, that gets you past that, right, is duty. Duty and obligation and responsibility and all the training that you have. You know, it's like you, you muster yourself and you do it. Um, you know, I, I love the movie Gettysburg. It's a long movie. It's based on a book that I love even better called uh, Killer Angels. But um, it's a great uh, story of the Battle of Gettysburg, and it, it does a really good job, particularly with um, it does a really good job with the second day of the battle and does a really good job with Pickett's charge on the third day of the battle. But um, you know, uh, it, it shows uh, it shows the, uh, the one colonel. Uh, 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 well, actually, I guess he was a, a lieutenant general, but he's rallying the troops, getting ready to make Pickett's charge, and he's an honest horse riding up back and forth in, in front of them, and telling them. You know, we've got to do this. We know our duty. We know our responsibility. We're going to do this. We're going to do this for our sweethearts. We're going to do this for our home. We're going to do this for Virginia. And you know, then they get ready to march out across the field into blazing fire. You know, hardly any of them come back. So 
Um, but um, you know, who doesn't? Who isn't fearful in a situation where you're about ready to go into the clamor of battle and, and death? And let's face it, battle in that day, I mean, it was bad enough. You know, it was bad enough in, in the, the 1800s. Bad enough in our day, of course. But uh, there, I mean, the ultimate end, end of battle was that you got up close and personal. I mean, you didn't kill too many people by long distance at this point in time. And I mean, it was it was a sword or 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 something that was knife like. Uh, they didn't even mostly have. I mean, pikes were not really even the thing. They they had some some sling throwers, some sling sling, some stone slingers, whatever they were. Right? Um, they had some of those, but I mean, everything was up close and personal. Uh, would there have been a reason to fear and tremble? Probably everyone, right? And so it goes down from 32,000 to 10,000. And the 10,000 that, that didn't say, yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm a little scared. Um, those those folks were just the ones probably putting on a good front. Um, that's what I would think, right? They're, they're, they're the ones who are too, are too manly to admit that they're fearful and, tr and trembling. So there's a little test. Um, God has Gideon take them to the watering hole, and um, who knows? I, I, I've heard people try to make an ex, uh, explanation about this, but I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why the test was made. But um, you know, it, it was made, and and the long and short of it is that it brings the army down to three thousand. Now, some of the people, three hundred, three hundred, excuse me, right, uh, three hundred. Uh, some of the people. Uh, when they went down to the watering hole, apparently would get down on their knees and their hands and put their face in the water and you know drink from the water, um, and that was the vast majority of them. Right? Those folks did not were not selected, but some of them would go down and they would just scoop water into their hand and then lick it out of their hands. And the thought is, I've heard the thought, and this is the part that we can't prove because the Bible doesn't tell us that those were the ones that were alert and aware. They were looking for engagement. They weren't going to be caught by surprise. They knew what they were there for, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know that it matters, because I think that ultimately, you know, what's the bottom line? This is a miracle, right? It, it does there need to be any human explanation uh, at all in what God did here? No, not really. Um, can God deliver Israel with 300 people? Yes, he can. And here's the weird thing. They didn't even really have to fight because they, you know, Gideon comes up with this plan after, you know, after another little thing that really gave him boldness. But he comes up with a plan that's absolutely, like, crazy. So uh, let's deal with that. Uh, he, goes into the, uh, he goes into the camp. He sneaks in. He does a little recon. Him and his, uh, him and, uh, and uh, uh, Pura, uh, his, uh, his aide, they sneak up to the camp of the Midianites, and while they're there in the dark watching and listening, one Midianite gets freaked out about a dream that he has. And um, another Midianite comes up, it, up and says, I have an interpretation. And he says that the interpretation of the dream is that Midian is going to be defeated by by Gideon and the armies of Israel. So it's like Gideon is sitting there listening to this going on and he realizes that God has even allowed the, the, um, the Midianites to almost prophesy their own defeat. And he's there to witness it. And all of this has been orchestrated by God just so that Gideon can be sure. I mean, if the fleece wasn't enough, right, then there's, then there's this. So Gideon can be sure, and once Gideon sees that, he realizes there's no doubt about this. There's no doubt about this at all. So he only had 300 people, but now suddenly he's bold. He's bold, and he's inventive, and he's creative. And the Bible doesn't tell us that this scheme was something that God put in his mind or that God instructed him to do. Gideon basically says to the people, do, do what I'm doing. And he lights a torch, and he gets a lamp, and he or a, a, a piece of pottery, puts it over the fire, and then they go. You know, they all do the same. They go into the camp, surround it, and then there's a blast and a yell, and they break the 
the, pre the vessels, the torches come out, there's sudden light in the midst of all the glamour, and the Midianite army goes, they go bonkers. <laughs> They just all they they're scared and they're they're like they're like shocked and they start killing each other. They start running. I mean, it's just an absolute it's just an absolute mess. And all the three hundred men. And then once this happens, um, the the remnants of the the uh, the, the Midianite and Amalekite armies. Um, they start trying to run various places. Gideon gets other folks involved in the battle. He calls out some more folks uh, to cut them off and to join in the, in, in the slaughter. Um, and they manage to, to basically get everyone, except for about 1,500 men. They get across the Jordan and, and, and or, you know, heading for basically someplace closer to home. Um, what does Midian do about that? Well, um, he uh, he ends up he ends up uh, following the trail of those that are trying to escape, and as he does so, I'm, I'm skipping the part about the Ephraimites. That's a that's a, a, a minor skirmish that we don't need to worry about um, at this point. But he gets across the Jordan, following the trail, and he gets to to the to the town of Succoth and. Uh, he asks for, for bread. His men are very hungry. They, you know, have been working all, all night long. They've been running after uh, the uh, the Amalekites. They've been killing people, you know, in battle, and, and they're famished. They they need some some en energy. They need some sustenance. And uh, the town tells him no. And he goes to the town of of, uh, of Peniel and gets the same kind of thing. And so. Uh, what Gideon says to the one town, because they say, you know, it, are the enemies in your hand yet? And we're not going to give you anything then. They're afraid of the, of the Midianites, and they don't give them anything. Uh, and, um, you know, they do, they do the same thing at Peniel. Now, uh, the town of Succoth, he says that he will, as a result of this, when he wins the day, he's going to come back and whip them with thorns. So there's a bunch of like sticker bushes and whatnot out there in that part of the desert, and he tells them, you know what? Don't give me bread. I'm when I when I go beat these guys, I'm coming back, and when I get here, I'm going to beat you <laughs> with with thorn bushes. And the town of Peniel, they they won't give him anything. He says, when I get back here, I'm going to knock down your tower. They had this big fortification in their 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 town. And then he goes after the Midianites, and he captures them, wipes them out. 300 men wipe out the 1,500, right? Um, wipes them all out, comes back to the towns, and he goes to, to the, he ran into a, a person from the town of Succoth and got names. And so he goes to Succoth, and he <laughs> calls out all the elders, and he whips them with thorn bushes. Um, I don't know how, I don't know how many, you know, I don't know how many lashes he gave them or anything else, um, but I bet they hurt. Um, in the town of Peniel, he went and he knocked down the tower and he killed all the men. Um, maybe it was better to get whipped with bushes than it was to, you know, would you rather be in Sakoth or in Peniel? Uh, uh, Peniel, you're, you're going to die. <laughs> Sakoth, you, you know, you, you have the scars to remind you of your chain. But you know, you live, you live, uh, you live to to breathe another day. Um, anyhow, he, he captures um, he captures the uh, the kings that were uh, in cahoots together, leading this this foray, um, and ends up uh, killing them. He tells his son to do it, but his son is too young and doesn't have the gumption, and so he kills um, he kills them himself. Now that little thing with the Ephraimites, um, the Ephraimites were not were not called to anything until the the, the the jars had been broken and the torches were out and the, and the Midianites were on the run. Um, and they were called out to basically stop them from getting across the Jordan, you know, to keep them from getting across the forts. And they did, they did that for the most part, other than that little band that we just talked about that got away. Um, but they were upset with Gideon uh, because 
they had not been called for the beginning of the battle. When the 32,000 came, the Ephraimites were not part of that call. And so they were upset about that. And Gideon says, you know, you, you killed all these people and you've got their generals, Zeb and Moreb. So what are you complaining about? You know, your fame is better than my fame. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so that's why I said it wasn't that big a deal. You know, they just kind of applied their pride a little bit and, and uh, all the you know, wounds were over. And that was basically the thing that, that gave Gideon you know, the major accomplishment of his judgeship. We're not told that he did anything else other than this, this thing really. Um, this was his real claim to fame, if you want to put it that way. But it did accomplish 40 years of respite for the Jewish people. While Gideon was alive, um, the Jewish people uh, had peace from the Midianites and the Amalekites and the peoples from the east. Um, and you know, after 40 years, after all of this was going on, uh, Gideon died, and then some. You know, then things were were messy, and we're going to see that we're not even done with the Gideon story in a way because his family line after him ends up, you know, getting involved with some some problems as we'll see in the next chapter. But that's the the, the basic thing, um, uh, the story as as we have it. Um, what was the aftermath? Um, there it is, the aftermath of the, uh, the initial battle, the pursuit and capture of Ziba and Zalmuna, the punishment of Sakath, uh, the destruction and death of uh, Peniel, and uh, the death of Ziba and Zalmuna, who are the kings. So uh, that is the, uh, you know, that's all of that. Now, one of the interesting things that happened after the battle was that um, Israel, people of Israel basically offered the kingship to Gideon. Now Israel did not have a king at this point in time. They won't have a king for quite a while, but Gideon is offered the kingship at this point in time, but he refuses it. And this is the one thing that really tells me that Gideon's faith was probably always there to some extent, even when he was wimpy, and even when, when he was dealing with a father that, that had an altar to Baal, uh, that was considered his own property, uh, even though all of those things existed and, and it didn't seem like he had a whole lot of good things to say to the angel of the Lord when he, when he popped up, uh, when Gideon is offered the kingship, just some kind of memory of, of all that God had said you know, in the days of Moses about that kind of a subject matter must have, must have uh, like taken hold of him because he refuses the kingship and he says, the Lord will be your king. So he, he reiterates the, the policy that has been true for Israel to this point in time from the days of Moses to this point in time, right? Israel had no king. And the reason that Israel had no king was the Lord was supposed to be Israel. It was supposed to be a theocracy. God was supposed to be the king of Israel. Um, we've seen, uh, just in the history of the judges that we looked at so far, that that wasn't going all that well. You know, it, it, it's you can't have God acting as the king of a free society in which people don't believe. Right? You know, you're not... That, that just doesn't work. Uh, it takes... It takes faith. Faith has to be, uh, the, you know, the common the common holding of, of, of a people if God's going to be king. Now, if you have that, things will work out. You know, things could work out well. But if you don't have that, that won't work. And it didn't work in all of Israel's history. We keep on seeing that phrase. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the interesting thing about that is that when people do what's right in their own eyes, do they do right at all? It doesn't seem like they do, right? Imagine that in our own society, if, if, if everyone did what was right in their own eyes, could you walk on the street? 
could you take a journey of 100 miles and be nonchalant about it? If everyone did what was right in his own eyes, it would kind of be like the Wild West, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of happening in New York. <laughs> with the wide rent, with the illegals. Well, I mean, it's like uh, any of our big cities. I mean, look at Chicago. Uh, Chicago is, uh, has been like murder capital of, of the world over the last five or six years. It just seems to calm down a little bit uh, recently, but it, you know, just crazy there. Um, it was that way back in the 20s, too. You know, we see, we see that, that people doing what's right in their own eyes is, is, not, is not a formula for success in society. Uh, because people who are doing right in their own eyes eventually will do what's good for them in their own eyes, regardless of whether it's good for anyone else. And then you get, then you get oppression, you get, you get crime, you get thuggery, you get, I mean, you, all that host of things comes out. So, you know, what was the, what's the, the, the transition kind of that we have in Judges? Yeah, Gideon here saying the thing that's the old perspective, God will be our king. But you have this little thing that's working its way the whole way through that we go through Judges. This isn't working. We need somebody who's going to hold, to hold everyone's feet to the fire and say, no, you don't get to do whatever you want to do. We have a law and you're going to abide by it. Right? So, Judges is, you know, serves as that transitional time where you're going from, from something that's, that's an attempt to be mosaic to something that ends up being Davidic. It's not, you know, David's still a while away is off, but you mean, ultimately David is the model of the Messiah, the model of the king uh, that only the Lord can be. Um, and in, uh, in the meantime, you get a human representatives in the kings of Israel. Now, did kings work in Israel? It was almost as bad. Under kings, it was almost as bad as it was when they had no kings. You still had people doing what they wanted to do, but usually they were people that had political favor. You know, so if somebody had wealth and influence with the king, they could trample over the poor, the unfortunate, the orphan, the widow. You know, it was pretty bad in that particular respect. And not only that, you know, how many kings do you have that were good? When the when the whole kingdom was together, it started off with Saul, eh, bad, right? Then you go to David, he was the model for kings thereafter. And then you go to Solomon, and it's like, even though that was kind of the height of the kingdom as far as his political power, he just was full of himself and, you know, decided that he was going to explore everything that he wanted to explore and uh, didn't really, didn't really abide by the law. And he set a pattern for, for most of the kings that followed. Now, uh, when the kingdom split, some of the kings in the south were actually faithful men. Yet some. But just as many were terrible men. And in the northern kingdom, in the kingdom that became Israel, rather than Judah, in the kingdom that became Israel, he had no good kings. There's not one king of Israel that's recorded as being godly, leading the people in godliness, calling the, the folks to worship God according to the law, not one. So, you know, is it any better with kings than it was without kings when everyone was doing right in his own eyes? Maybe marginally better. Um, ultimately, I guess what I'm trying to get to is whether you have a king or you don't have a king, when you're dealing with sinners, there is no good solution. Right? The, only thing that, the only thing that's going to solve anything in a big time way is when we hear a trumpet and see Jesus come bursting through the sky. Then, then something in politics will work. Then something in civic government governance will work. In the meantime, it's just always trying to cobble bits and pieces together the best way that you can. Even in a place like America, where there's so there was so much 
and remains to be so much potential. The fact of the matter is, still de dealing with sinners, right? And uh, no way to have, no way to have paradise on earth, no way to have perfection on earth when sin is running amok.